Hi everyone, I'm Steffi D. And I'm Lisa H. And welcome to Check In From Away. This week we are checking in with Ali Moman and Torkel Campbell from Soft Revolution. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> guess what? What? I'm super excited about today's episode of Check In From Away because we have two incredible guests. We have Come From Away Toronto's Ali Moman, as well as Torkel Campbell from the band Stars. And together, they have a podcast called Soft Revolution. And honestly, Lisa, after speaking to them today, they have renewed my hope and my joy and everything I love about theater. Yeah, they're pretty inspiring guys. And I have to tell you, I'm fangirling pretty hard right now on tour. Stars, the album Set Yourself on Fire 2004 was the soundtrack of my life when I moved to Toronto, and I probably listened to it 50 million times, so I'm pretty stoked to get to meet him today. Also, no big deal, I guess we should mention that Ali Momin is running for the Ontario Liberal Party. No big deal. Right, it's like premiere by day, come from away by night. Let's check in with them now, Lisa. Hey, my name is Ali Moman, and I was uh, in Come From Away in Toronto with these uh, two cool kids. Um, and uh, also, I'm uh, the co-host of Soft Revolution, the podcast, with uh, this guy named Torkel Campbell, who's the lead singer of Stars. And I'm currently running for the Ontario Liberal nomination. So, you know, busy, busy, lemon squeezy. So, in a, a whopping 14 months since we, since we did the show, do you remember any of your lines? Uh, yeah, I think so. Really? Oh, okay. I like, I like don't, I don't think. Hello, all you come from awares. My name is Torquil Campbell, and I am the host of the Soft Revolution podcast, along with a young man named Ali Moman, who is a past member of Come From Away in Toronto and a dear friend of mine. Um, but I come by the podcasting world kind of circuitously. I'm a musician by profession. I play in a band called Stars. And uh, I've also been an actor for a long time, come from a theater family, so kind of been doing it since I was a kid. And um, in the last few years, I've started writing more. I wrote a play called True Crime a few years ago that I performed all over the country. And uh, I've got a new play called The Disappearances coming up at Crow's Theater next year. So I kind of do whatever people want me to, as long as it involves imagining things. Um, That's my gig. <laughs> I love it. And Torque, did you know that your sister Beatrice was a guest on our show two episodes ago? No way. Yeah, I'll did. try and meet her high standards, though I'm sure she would agree I'll fail. <laughs> oh my God. Soft Revolution basically is uh, formed on the premise that, you know, there needs to be more art and politics and politics and art. So it's just basically um, uh, viewing the world through the artistic lens and through artist lens. So it's not just a, you know, a, a, a podcast about um, you know, art, but it's also about fusing the two things together. In the beginning, it really became like a plague diary because we literally started you know, right when this, this, this uh, sugar sandwich began. And um, yeah, but it's, but it's really turned into a place where artists all across the world, you know, some very well-known artists, some lesser known artists just come and basically uh, put their lens and their perspective on, on the world. Because, you know, we need more art and we need more artists engaged everywhere. Amazing. So, Ali, why is it that me and Lisa have not been a guest on your <laughs> podcast? Y'all, because you, you guys are too hard, you know, too, uh, you guys are too popular, too famous. There's a threshold <laughs> that we can't, that we can't go above. But there you go. I see, I see this, you know, the subliminal. Okay, we'll call you soon. The podcast came out of the fact that me and Ali are pals and we had so many nights together at the Shaw Festival when Ali was working there and my wife was working there where we would meet at the bar after the show and Ali and I would get into these endless conversations slash arguments about various political topics that neither of us knew very much about. Um, but it became clear to us over the years of our friendship that, you know, our two big passions were art and politics and I think Ali and I, the one big thing that Ali and I really agree on and really feel strongly about is that there needs to be more cultural voices in the political world. There needs to be more artistic thinking in the world of politics and that artists should play a bigger role in public policy. 
And so the podcast really came out of that idea of blending culture, art, politics, finding that intersection where all three of them meet and really arguing for the idea that the world would be a better place if art was more present, not just in our theaters and in our galleries, but in our, in our halls of power and in our public policy. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what Soft Revolution ultimately is about. Is it's, a, it's an advocacy podcast to some degree, arguing that art matters and that artists have more to contribute to society than just things that are pretty, that they have a, a, a compassion and an imagination and um, improvisational thinking on a really high level and that those things can add a huge amount to the public discussion. Let's just say, let's just say, you know, I love, you know, if you listen to Tork, he, he, you know, Tork is famous for his rants. And let's just say, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that Logic has a, you know, you could splice things up and you could, you know, just like truncate and you could do a little editing here and there. Because sometimes I'm like, the world is not ready for this one, Tork. The world <laughs> is not ready for this one. Soft Revolution, the name of it is actually taken from a star song on Set Yourself on Fire, there's a song called Soft Revolution. For me, what that means, Soft Revolution, is, you know, what my father, Douglas, who was a great actor, taught me was that in art, you must never ever pick any fight that you are not certain you will lose. That is what makes you an artist. Winning is for jocks. Losing is for the rest of us. And we're here to talk about y'all. So if you ain't losing, you ain't an artist. And that can be hard to face, but it's true. Art is about surrender. And soft revolution is about surrender, you know? And once you surrender, there's nothing anybody can do to you, man. You're free. Opening night in Toronto, just seeing the face of my niece after she saw the show. And, know, and, and, and knowing that, you know, we were, you know, we were doing something special. I had, a, I had a mentor of mine when I was at Shaw early on, and he said, Ali, you know, you're going to be able to hopefully, luckily, count in the palm of your hand amazing experiences in your career. And I feel like we had five or six or seven or eight of those or ten of those amazing experiences in one show. I know my greatest memory that I'll hold really, really dear in my life is, is getting to do um, plays with my parents, with my mom and dad. Um, over the years, we did tons of things together and, and getting to know them as colleagues and not just as my parents was an amazing privilege that not many people have. And that I'll really, really always be grateful for that. And I'll always be really, really grateful for having had the opportunity to do a play with Philip Seymour Hoffman for a long time in New York City. He and I did a play together and worked very closely together. And, uh, you know, he was just an incredible, incredible mentor to me and inspiration. And um, it was very devastating when he died uh, because Phil really represented to me everything that an actor should be, which is open, cheerful, irreverent, hardworking, kind, um, fierce, honest. Um, he just brought every single quality that you need to be a great artist to the table and he shared it with everyone around him. And uh, he's, he's a great loss. His death was a massive, massive loss to the theater. He was looked at as a movie star, but really Phil took all that money that he made and put it back into the theater, put it back into his own theater company put it back into supporting young artists. That's the kind of guy he was. And, I, you know, when you're working with someone like that, sometimes you don't realize at the time how privileged you are to have the experience. But every moment that I spent with Phil, I was aware of how much of a lucky thing it was to be in his presence. He was a, a wonderful guy. Just how incredibly uh, uh, prescient, brilliant artists are. And that in many, in many respects, we kind of put ourselves in a box and we need to step outside it. And that there is a manner of thinking that exists inside us and a manner of being that is a fusion of the head and heart and soul that is very much lacking 
And what's amazing about us artists, one of the best exchanges that I had was with uh, Daniel Handler, AKA Lemony Snicket. And he said, I asked him, I said, so what are you thinking about in respect to the pandemic now? And he paused and he said, he goes, you know, I'm not really thinking about now. I'm always thinking about the future. And that is something that as artists, we inherently do. We are constantly going beyond just the moment, constantly going beyond what's in front of us. And we're always seeking to go deeper and seeking to go farther. So for me, it was just a really proof of concept that we need more of this type of thinking in our lives. Wouldn't it be great? You know, also think about it. Look, come from away. What was come from away? It was an idea. It was just a harebrained idea that all of a sudden turned into a multi, 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 multi million dollar enterprise. Yeah. We are doers. We are thinkers. We are creative folk. And we need to have more creativity intersecting in our government. It's very important. This year, artists have faced a crisis of identity. And that, um, you know, not just artists, but I think artists in particular, actually, because we were the first to leave our jobs and will be the last to go back to them. I think it left a lot of people in their mid-career, people like me, people like Ali, and a lot of the people we've spoken to this year in a place of real questioning about who they were without the art they made. You know, I, I for example, um, you know, I've been an, an artist since I was eight years old. I was a child actor. And so pretty much all my life, I've been used to the show, to going to the show, to having that experience of getting up on stage and performing. And this is easily the longest time in my life that I haven't done that uh, since I was eight years old. And it's really in the worst parts of this for me have been about getting to a place where I felt like I didn't really know who I was without the work that I did. And I think a lot of artists that we've talked to this year have expressed that. But I also think that they there's been gifts from it, which is that I think artists have had to go and find who they are beyond how the world sees them. You know, a lot of the time artists are dependent in terms of their career on public perception, whether it's a critic's review or it's audience response or it's how the industry sees them. We are often in a position of trying to impress. And I think um, a year without that has been tough because it's what we do, but it's also been, I think, kind of a great break for a lot of people and given them a chance to step back a little bit from the work they do and ask themselves what, who they really are outside of it. So we've, have a, we've had a lot of discussions this year with people about identity, about you know, how much your work informs your sense of self as an adult, and maybe that's not so healthy, that maybe like we need to all have a sense of identity apart from the work we do. The question of like, why are you running really quickly became how could you not be? And just that desire to do something became so palpable. If more interaction is going to be work from home than less, what is a city? Why does it exist if it no longer matters where you live? So we have to start to think about how do we oxygenate a city? And I think culture is one of those ways we do it because that's what gets people out of their butts and in outside and engaging with each other. But we have to start to now think about the future. I get it. This pandemic is crazy. Like every day you're like, oh my God, I got to get my vaccine. And it's really hard to like think past the current moment, but we have to be thinking about the future. So if it's like, why am I running? It's because I'm not thinking about just now. I'm literally constantly thinking about what's next. It's crazy what we're doing. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Like, think about it. The yeah. amount of collaboration. And what's also amazing about what we do is like, we are in rooms where people have disparate ideas and we disagree and we like, sometimes we hate each other, sometimes we love each other. But at the end of the day, what's most important is that best idea needs to win. Yeah. And that there's something more important than our egos that needs to be completed. Now, imagine if we took that spirit, that creative spirit and that creative process, and we put it into the legislature in which it isn't just about scoring a point for an immediate end, but it is actually about going farther, you know? So that's, that's really why it's been like this thing about Ali. Why, why do you want to go into politics? Now, people who know me, I, I guess both of you are like, oh, you know, finally Ali moment is doing this, but 
But for me, it was like, why me? It's because you know what's missing? We have enough lawyers. We have enough Bay Street. We need to get some artists in there. We need to like get some creative mojo going. We need to spark that place up a little bit because I think we'd be in a much better place. I know this, that it took a lot of bravery for all of us to shut down. It took a lot of bravery for everyone in this society to not see the people they loved, uh, to you know wear masks all the time, to do all the things we've done to try and save our healthcare system and save each other. That took a lot of courage and a lot of bravery, but it's not normal life and it's not a plan. And it's going to take courage and bravery on all of our parts as arts workers and as lovers of the arts to go back. And we have to, we have to find that bravery within ourselves when it's safe to return. And when we feel safe doing it, we have to go in there and not live in fear and not let our fear of this virus control our human impulse to be together and to tell each other the story of our lives. Because those things are just as crucial as any aspect of our society. To be together and to hear each other's stories is, is, is as important as being educated, as you know, eating right, as exercising, all the things we do to keep ourselves alive. We die without other people. And the performing arts is, has been for so long the most joyous way for people to be together. So what I really, really hope is that when the performing arts come back, what it looks like is a celebration of being together and not a place where we are trying to avoid one another but still have the experience. That's not gonna work. We can't, there's no economic model where a 20% full room works. There's no, there's no spiritual model where the sound of a cheering crowd can never be heard again. That just isn't human, it's not possible. So I think, you know, everyone's gonna have their own speeds about what they're comfortable doing and what, they, what they're comfortable going back to. And whether it's our audiences or it's ourselves, I think we're gonna have to have masses of compassion for each other and kind of let each other go on our own pace and be understanding that for some people, this trauma is deep and for other people, they're ready to jump right back into the pool. Yeah. So it's gonna be complicated, but at the end of it, it's what it's gotta be, what we have to, the, the light at the end of our tunnel is a room full of people clapping their hands and singing along. That's where we're going. And if we don't get there, we're not home yet. I miss theater because I miss the, the, the serendipity of, of, of a moment that I don't know the result of. I miss, I, it's the serendipity of what happens when human beings are uh, congregated together and experiencing a shared moment. I miss theater because I miss smelling and hearing breath. Amazing. And feeling breath. Oh, it's the Hagen dazs ice cream bars at intermission. That's why I miss ah! the theater. <laughs> you know, when someone just has a Hagen dazs stand. Where else in the world are you given 20 minutes to consider whether or not you should have an ice cream bar? Nowhere. It never happens. But at the theater, they're like, there they are for the whole 20 minutes. They're like, come on, I'm right here. It's not even a lineup. Um, I love that. No, I, what do I, what do I miss about the theater? My God, so many things. You know what I miss the most, I, and what I love the most about theater and about live music, is the moment when the lights go down. And you can feel the audience collectively deciding to be children again, to let their state of wonder take over themselves. You, that's a beautiful moment. And in student matinees, you know, I love it when, when the lights go down and all the kids scream because kids are sensible enough to let themselves express that sense of wonder instead of keeping it inside. They just go, woo, you know, because it's exciting. The lights go down and we're in another world and we've given over to the story and we are all helpless. And I think that's a beautiful, essential part of being a person that I really miss. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Check In From Away. See you next, next Tuesday. Cheers. Cheers. So thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. 
We wanted to talk about soft resolution. Wow, I did that with Ali too. For some reason, I cannot say soft revolution. I always want to say soft resolution. I think that's because you have a, a mind that goes towards harmony and accord, <laughs> trying to find a resolution. You know what? Probably. It's a Freudian yeah. slip. Um that should be another <laughs> podcast, which is like soft revolutions, all the bad stuff, and soft resolutions, all the good stuff. You can you can have it. Go ahead. Start that's, it. That's amazing. So anyway, great. Um, we're gonna edit that out. Let me start over. <laughs>